In this video, we're going to be talking about a paper that came out recently, which for the very first time demonstrated that vaccinal COVID-19 vaccinal mRNA can be found in human breast milk. My name is Dr. Mikhail Arashek, and before we get started, I wanted to let you know I'm going up a very steep trail. So, excuse the breathing. <laughs> At some point, I'll try to go slow so I don't torture you. And also, stay till the end of the video to find out how you could get free tickets to some of our some of our events. So this paper that came out is truly monumental if it turns out to be true. Why do I say if it turns out to be true? It's because it's the first finding of its kind showing that the mRNA vaccines can be distributed to other tissues than the site of, in of injection. And there's other first of its kind observations in this paper as well. We're going to get to that as well. And of course it has to be repeated so we know if it's accurate or not. One possibility is that perhaps there was a contamination issue and I'm sure the authors tried really hard to make sure that's not the case. And the way they were able to demonstrate this is by is through PCR. So the same way we do it with COVID-19 when you test for COVID-19. So how does PCR work? You use tiny DNA fragments to anneal to a genetic material of interest that's either the virus or in this case the vaccine and you amplify it over and over and over until you can detect it. And this is, this is how PCR works before they started testing for the vaccine in the breast milk they did they set this up correctly so they tested it first whether the system would work they took some leftover vaccine samples they had they put that inside human breast milk and that that was from pre-covid samples so you knew that they were not going to be contaminated with the virus and they were able to then to show that they can detect that and they were able to detect it down to one picogram of the genetic material per mil of breast milk which is very very little we're going to talk about that right away as well so what did they do in this study is they looked at 11 women sorry they call them individuals i assume they were women because of the fact that well they were they all gave birth and within six months of giving birth to their child they were vaccinated five of them five and six of them were vaccinated with either moderna or pfizer vaccine so both mrna vaccines were being tested and these authors were able to detect mrna vaccines in five and breast milk of five out of those 11 individuals inside what essentially the authors refer to as extracellular vesicles and some of those out of those five individuals they were also able to detect it directly in the breast milk as well but five out of 11 they were detecting in extracellular vesicles that's actually very important though. so we're going to expand on that as well on average, they were detecting about nine picograms of the mRNA vaccine per mil. Now, because they did PCR, that means, it means, first of all, that we don't know whether that vaccine actually works or not, number one. So we don't know whether it can be used to produce spike protein, and they didn't test for that. And number two, we don't know if it's just a fragment of vaccine or whether this would include whole vaccine or not. So. That's another potential limitation. <clears throat> but nevertheless, some genetic material of the mRNA vaccine was being detected. And why, why is the extracellular vesicles important? Because in essence, what do we mean by extracellular vesicles? These are basically fragments of cells that can come off. Think of like tiny blobs of cell. I like to call them blobs. Clearly that's not a scientific term. The scientific term is extracellular vesicles. But think of tiny blobs that come off of the cell membrane. So they mimic 
it's like a mini cell. They mimic the cell, they have the same membrane as the composition as the cell itself. And these extracellular vesicles, they can carry both proteins inside as well as inside the membrane, as well as genetic material. So that's already known, including mRNA. So we, we've known that from the past. What, what are these extracellular, extracellular vesicles? There's three types. Number one is apoptotic bodies. So that those are the biggest. They're very large. Basically, when a cell dies, specific type of cell death called apoptosis, it literally disintegrates into fragments. And, and, uh, and that's, hence those are the, the largest you can find. Let's see if I can show you the leg behind me a little bit. There you go. And there's also microcellular vesicles. These are smaller in size. And then there's the last ones, which we've already talked about in the past. They are exos called exosomes. So these are the smallest ones. And they're so small, they're pretty much the size of, of coronavirus. Very similar in size. So, uh, Now, this is the first time ever shown that these exosomes, and we know they're talking about exosomes, they didn't specifically talk about that, but based on the size that they're isolated, we know these are exosomes. So this is the first time we see exosomes being able to transport vaccinal mRNA. And we've already known from the past, and I made a video on this, that exosomes can also be used to transport the spike protein itself directly as well. For a very long time. Now, why is this important? <laughs> and th this is where it can get very crazy. So we're going to talk about hypotheticals here that, and I'm not saying this could be true or that this is true, but we're going to talk about hypotheticals just to give you an example of how wild genetics can be. It's a really, really crazy world. So, they were isolating about nine picograms of, of mRNA, vaccinal mRNA, inside these, per mil, inside these vesicles. And what does that mean? So let's talk about the actual volume. When vaccine is administered, depending on whether it's a Pfizer or Moderna, we're talking about 30 to 50 micrograms of genetic material being injected. And wow, <laughs> beautiful views. <laughs> I'm seeing it through the lens of the camera. Uh, and if you take one microgram and divide it by a thousand, that's you get to one nanogram. And then if you divide that by another thousand, you finally get to a picogram. So, what that means is that in theory, if you were to inject one of those vaccines, you can create millions of such extracellular vesicles being transported through the body. Now, this is also the first time ever so far that has been observed that vaccine can get into breast tissue. They don't know how, but they speculate that it must be getting there either through blood system or lymphatic system where these exosomes can travel through. And previously exosomes have indeed been found in the blood and isolated from the blood and then they must enter mammary glands and end up in a breast milk but this clearly demonstrates that potentially potentially vaccines can be distributed to other body parts and we've never studied that we actually still don't know after well we're approaching two years we're approaching two years since vaccines have been administered around the world we still never studied as to where in the body they might be distributed. And this is the first confirmation that they could be going somewhere else besides, besides the injection site. This has been shown that the vaccines can go to other body parts, but not in humans. This has only been shown in rats. And we did discuss that in a prior video as well. So that's another very important important message. The, here's the good news though, is that these are very small amounts and after 48 hours, because the 
the breast milk from these individuals was collected prior to vaccination and for number of days after vaccination and and after 48 hours no mRNA was able to be detected in in the samples at all so the authors claim and this is the good news is that as far as they're concerned breastfeeding post birth is still safe so still as CDC has been pronouncing all this time without any supporting data but CDC has been saying that and uh, they, they think yeah it's still safe just maybe avoid breastfeeding for the first two days after vaccination so uh, so that that's the that's the good news but what are the wild theories that we could be talking about well if we're talking about vaccines getting mRNA vaccines material getting inside exosomes well exosomes are so tiny as I mentioned they can be the size of coronavirus it's not unreasonable to think that exosomes could be shed through your body we don't know if this happens so this statement is purely hypothetical but it's not unreasonable because of the similarity of size including perhaps through the breath and the reason why I want to even mention this possibility is because of this theory that public itself has created suggesting that there is a concept of what is referring referred to as shedding which has not been confirmed at all in science but the concept of shedding is that came from unvaccinated women whose menstrual cycles were affected because of presence their presence to presence with individuals who were vaccinated so let's say their partners or family members or co-workers and that hasn't been studied investigated so we don't even know if it's if it's real but it shows you if it were to be real this could suggest one possible mechanism of how this could happen but there the reason why exosomes and having mRNA vaccines and exosomes is so crazy and should be studied in much greater detail is because we already know from the past that and I'm feeling a gust of wind so apologies we'll see if this will allow the video to survive or not <laughs> survive the cut cut process or not the reason why is because in the past it has been shown that exosomes can be used to introduce foreign genetic material inside mice genomes so your genome is your entirety of your DNA that it resides inside the nucleus and basically is the brains of the cell and this group of authors showed that when DNA is broken and DNA can be broken for many reasons for example during cell division it's literally broken in half it's called double-stranded break because your DNA inside your nucleus is double-stranded there are two complementary strands that can anneal with one another and that's how you get double double stranded helix and when you have a double stranded break it means both of those strands are broken and you literally rip the DNA apart now this happens all the time either naturally in a cell or through introducing of of materials through exposure to exogenous or outside materials that could be toxic think of like reoxy, re, re, reactive oxygen species chemicals and that can rip the DNA apart and your cell has to fix it and in the process of fixing it appears that at times extra genetic material can be inserted including genetic material that is already pre that is natural to you but it also includes foreign genetic material which is crazy I didn't even know that to be honest that such possibility could exist as well as mRNAs natural mRNAs residing within a, in a cell my video cut out I was talking about how MR, mice mRNA has been shown that it can be incorporated back into mouse genomes by first being converted back into DNA through natural processes this is called and it's called cDNA 
and fragments of it can be incorporated into the genome which is basically crazy stuff and we already know that we do have mechanisms molecular mechanisms inside our body that in theory could be converting mRNA back to DNA this has only been demonstrated in cells outside the body and unusual cells these are cancerous cells so I'm not saying that this happens inside the body because that's never been demonstrated but what I'm trying to say is that clearly we know that genetic material can be insanely elastic and why these processes even exist in the first place is actually to the authors speculated of, of the studies that this is to increase potentially genetic diversity because the genetic diversity is basically what helps species to survive whenever there's catastrophic environmental changes so the greater the genetic diversity of a given species the more likely it will be able to to survive massive environmental changes so so this the fact that mRNA vaccines are being discovered potentially to be distributed through exosomes should not be trivialized at all at all and should be investigated in much greater detail and we should definitely be looking in, in detail as to whether this is true and what could be the potential consequences of, of, of that whether they're benign or not and obviously we're banking they're the benign and most likely it's all benign but we should definitely be confirming this all right i'm gonna pause right there going to let you know hey have you we have another COVID q a event coming up check out other videos to learn more what these are all about if you want free tickets to them then the first 10 people who subscribe to our, our newsletter post this video will send you free tickets and uh we have another event coming up as well this is for business owners where we offer a wellness program to business owners their employees if you're very interested in this also let us know okay you can also check out other videos to learn more about the details trying to make this video shorter <laughs> i wanted to let you know that hey listen if you haven't also if you haven't subscribed to the channel subscribe because this is how we grow share the video this is obviously also how we grow give us a like leave us a comment what you think about this <laughs> information and and uh what it, what does it mean if you think uh, that vaccines could be spreading through exosomes if you have an opinion on that thanks to anyone who give us super thanks as well and for now bye everyone keep it keep it fun keep it real and keep it active <laughs> bye everyone